As we pick up where we left off at Habakkuk 2, may I remind you that Habakkuk lived in Judah uh, in the days preceding her downfall to the Chaldeans. Israel to the north, the northern tribes, had already been swept away by Assyria. Uh, and though they are a people virtually unknown in Habakkuk's day, the Chaldeans, better known to us by their later name, the Babylonians, are about to rise and take Assyria by the throat. And they're going to do the same thing to Judah, the people of God, as well. And not that Judah didn't have it coming. Of course, she did. She was, in Habakkuk's day, utterly corrupt and riddled with injustice. Habakkuk has cried out to the Lord. We assume that his cries were for the Lord to bring reformation. God has answered Habakkuk's pleas with the most devastating response. He is going to raise up the Chaldeans, that wicked, bitter, and hasty nation who is both vicious and idolatrous to a proverb to be the instrument of punishment and justice. Habakkuk cannot understand. How can this be? Now, how can God take such wicked men and use them to punish his own people? How can you do this, God, is the sum and substance of Habakkuk's prayer at this point. He asks, he, he, he reaches out to God in prayer, and then he takes his station and he waits. Herein is the lesson for us today, dear flock. Often enough, we're commanded to pray. Today, we're reminded by the prophet's faithful example that when we pray, we must ask expectantly, and then we must wait for the answer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, speaking of which and of whom. Father, we thank you for everything your word has to say to us and to teach us, sometimes the harder lessons of our faith. But herein we are made more and more like our Savior, who also had to live by faith, who had to pray expectantly and then wait for your answers, Father, however long they took in whatever form they took. Thank you for his example. Thank you for his perfect sympathy in this matter, our great high priest. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Habakkuk chapter 2, we'll be reading verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the the tower, and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Ask and you will receive. Remember who said that? Jesus to his disciples. We hear him say that uh, today, and our 21st century minds look for Instant answers. And why not? I mean, we have instant messaging. We have instant coffee. We have instant voicemail, instantly cooked meals in the microwave. A conversation with someone hundreds, even thousands of miles away almost instantly with the press of a few buttons. And these days we hate waiting. Don't mail the form to me. Fax it. We used to say back in the late 20th century. Now we say scan and send, right? No waiting is the sign we love to see. And some of us can remember, can't we, when it was actually a touted virtue of a certain brand of ketchup that it made us wait in anticipation, right? Now when you go buy that same brand of ketchup, you pick it up in a squeeze bottle, right? 
We don't want to wait. Uh, those same people, by the way, that I'm describing to you can still remember well that crackling, scratching sound. You can hear it in your heads right now. of The computer modem scrounging for a signal on that dial-up internet provider through copper lines, can you believe it, uh, to check our email. Now we communicate at the speed of light, literally. We hardly know what it means to wait anymore. How foreign to our modern American experience is the genuine Christian life. Time and time again in Scripture, true discipleship, real spiritual strength is described in this single word. Wait. Nowhere is that the case more than it is with prayer. We ask and we want a visible answer. Not later today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, nor certainly three decades from now. We want it. We want it now. We, we want prayer to work like the push button, the ignition button on a, a 2025 model vehicle, right? A brand new car. The saints before us knew better, if for no other reason, that they, that they knew from life in general what it was to wait Dear flock, prayer and discipleship and walking in the ways of God is a matter of waiting, sometimes long, sometimes even torturously difficult periods of time. How long did Habakkuk have to wait for his answer? Was it days, weeks, months, years? It didn't matter. Habakkuk was willing to wait. He was persistent in his waiting, which is actually our first point this morning. When we pray to God, dear ones, we must wait persistently for his answer. Now, having prayed, the prophet takes his place in his spiritual watchtower. Now, what do men do on a watchtower? Well, I mean, to ask the question is to answer it, right? They, 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 they watch, and they watch earnestly. Sometimes those on a watchtower are guarding inmates within. Sometimes they're guarding from invaders without. Others sit in watchtowers to monitor for fires or for other dangers. Uh, whatever the case, they're watching, and they're watching how? Intently, right? They're, they're listening, they're looking, their senses are peaked and attuned to what is coming, and though often they neither see nor hear anything, yet they remain awake, alert, always watching, always waiting. How often do you and I act that way after we have prayed? Tell me. Alas, we sometimes rise from our knees after prayer, and no sooner have we risen than we've forgotten what we've prayed about, leaving it behind, acting as though we had not just had a conversation with, of all people, the Almighty God, the ruler of the universe, just finished asking Him to act. James writes in his letter, remember, that we do not have because what? We do not ask, yes. But could it be that having asked, we don't receive because we don't wait? Or at least we fail to recognize what we have received because we did not watch. Alexander White laid his finger on the problem this way. He said, there are men among us who do not neglect prayer who yet sadly neglect to watch and wait for God's promised answer to their prayers. Prayer, when we think of it and perform it aright, prayer is a magnificent thing and a venturesome for any man to do. For prayer builds and fits out and mans and launches a frail vessel of faith on the deep and wide sea of God's sovereignty, 
and sets her sails for a harbor, nothing short of heaven. And then the wise merchantman gives God and his ship time to be on her way back again. And then, like Habakkuk, he sets himself on his high tower. And all his interests are now up there. As Paul has it, all his conversation is in heaven. All his treasures and all his affections are launched on that sea adventure. He is now so intensely watching up there. I'm convinced, my brethren, that we lose many answers to our prayers, not so much because we do not pray, as because we do not go up to our tower to watch for and to welcome God's answers to our prayers. And then White's imagination rises to heaven itself, and he overhears this conversation, this divine conversation. Why should I answer? Our God may well say to his waiting and ministering angels. Why should I answer him? He pays no attention to my answers to, uh, to his prayer. He is never on his watch when I send my answer. And even when I do send my answers to his house and to his heart, he takes them and holds them as common and everyday things. He never wonders at my grace to him. He never performs his vow for my goodness to him. He holds a thousand, he and his, of my benefits. But he does not seem to know it. My brethren, concludes White, I am as sure as I am standing here that we would all get far more and far more wonderful answers to prayer if only we were far more on the outlook for them. We must pray persistently for the answers to our prayers, not Waiting and persisting for the answers to our prayers is the perfect demonstration of the lack of faith on our part, on our Father's, in our Father's ability to answer. It's to betray the fact that we've prayed with no great confidence in His willingness to answer our prayers. No expectation that He would hear. Dr. Lloyd-Jones expresses it perfectly this way. He says, nothing so shows the character of our faith as our conduct and our attitude after we have prayed. The test of our faith is whether we expect an answer to our prayer. We must wait persistently for answers to prayer. At the same time, however, we must also wait patiently for the answers so easily we grow restless, don't we, and impatient, even rebellious, our hearts demanding an answer. We want an answer. We want it right now. We can hardly imagine that the answers to our prayers may actually take years, decades even, to arrive. Some prayers take centuries to be answered. Imagine how many generations prayed faithfully, generation after generation after generation, for the coming of Jesus, for his advent. How long they prayed and pled that the Messiah would come for years and years, and, he, and then they died, not having seen the answer. Their patience was rewarded, of course it was, but, but not before being tested long and even all their lives. Is there something you've been praying for all your life long? Patience. Other prayers, though they don't take years, still seem long in the coming, don't they? Remember Daniel praying? You remember how he watched Daniel did and waited for God's answer to his prayers for his people? After three weeks of prayer, with fasting, the answer comes. And when it does, well, listen to these enormously encouraging words. 
Daniel, says the messenger to him in the vision, Daniel, greatly loved, would you please remember that about yourself? How often I'm at pains in this house to remind you who you are and where you stand with regard to your Father in heaven. When you receive the answers to your prayers, would you please remember who you are to him, dearly loved, that's you. Daniel, greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. He hears your every word, every word of your heart. We can multiply the examples from Scripture and from church history. You, dear ones, I know I know that you have prayed and you have waited long, so long for some answer from God. Perhaps it's it's been for the salvation of a loved one or for deliverance from some particular sin or some persistent temptation that dogs you every day. Perhaps like Habakkuk, you're waiting for understanding of some difficult, even baffling providence. You keep praying and keep waiting. Wait patiently for him. And while you're waiting, have some talks with yourself. Hold some soliloquies, some conversations with your own soul. Maybe along these lines. Say not my soul, from whence can God relieve my care? Remember that omnipotence has servants everywhere. God's help is always sure. His method seldom guessed. Delay will make our pleasure pure. Surprise will give it zest. His wisdom is sublime. His heart supremely kind. God never is before his time and never is behind. Be comforted at heart. Thou art not left alone. Now thou the Lord's companion art. Soon thou shalt share his throne. We must wait persistently for the answers to our prayers. We've got to wait patiently for the answer to our prayers. Third, quietly. Quietly for the answer to our prayers. Think of the watchman during, especially the wee hours of the night. They must be alert. Listen even for the smallest sound. But you cannot listen unless you have quiet. This also is foreign, isn't it, to our modern experience. We have filled our lives with noise. Distraction, externally and internally. Externally, we've filled every moment, have we, with the distractions of the radio and the television and the internet and the telephone and the video game. Now, not that any of those things are in themselves intrinsically sinful. They're not. But the cumulative effect of these things is that we have hardly a silent moment, hardly a time quiet to ourselves before God to be still and know that I am God. Our lives are filled with noise and distractions without and within. We are far too much of the time in a turmoil, our, our minds racing over our problems our sadnesses, our worries, our concerns. Round and round and round we we turn our minds over the very worries and the problems and concerns that we've ostensibly entrusted to God in prayer. Meditation. Though clearly a sound and biblical practice, meditation, 
We've left that to the Eastern mystics, haven't we? While we cram activity and busyness into every nook and cranny, racing bodies and minds from one thing to another to another in frenetic rat race. Habakkuk knew that to hear the voice of God, he needed to be still. He needed to quiet himself. It is that still, small voice that he awaited and that we must await too in the quietness of time spent meditating on the Word, in, in prayer, conversing with God from the depth of the soul, in, as Jesus described, part of our prayer lives, in the closet, in the time of quiet before Him. We've got to make this time. We've got to make it and then guard it. Sometimes, most times, it comes while reading the Word, these answers do. Suddenly, you know, something you read comes rising from the page in answer to your prayer that you've been patiently awaiting. Something comes maybe to your understanding. I've had marvelous testimonies from some of you over the years of your own experience of this, how you've been struggling through some problem. And I've prayed with you, but then, then, then you went and you spent time in the Word and and suddenly a passage that you may have read many, many times takes on a sudden new application to you. It comes popping off the page, you know. I remember a Christian woman from many years ago who was so struggling with an issue in her marriage and praying and, and pleading about this until one day she came to a passage. Interestingly, it was a passage about, of all things, how to respond to a tyrant. And you'll remember this passage because we studied it not long ago here in this house from Ecclesiastes 10. And she came to me and she said, my heart has been turned and I, I can carry on, Pastor John, in this situation. And she had a new spring in her step. But not until after weeks and weeks of exercising patience in what was an extremely difficult marital situation. Sometimes the answer comes actually uh, directly to a quieted mind. I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, a thought providentially ordered so impresses itself on your mind and your spirit, that it is an unmistakable gift from God. Thank you, Lord, for that thought. It's been pointed out in the Hebrew, uh, that the Hebrew here can be translated as waiting to see what God will say in me. Of course, we've got to be very careful with that, don't we? To hold all of the thoughts of our hearts and minds to the standard of God's Holy Word, but there is no doubt in my mind that God will sometimes come to us with an answer by providentially fixing some thought in place, even giving us a dream in the night by which He brings providentially some wonderful answer to our prayers. As William Cooper put it this way, he said, Sometimes a light surprises, you know this, we sing it together, don't we? Sometimes a light surprises the Christian, while he sings, it is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. Another way he answers us is with some providence, uh, something in the circumstances of our lives, which we observe when we are quieted before him, when we are quiet enough to weigh the events of the day, and maybe of the week in our minds, to go back to consider, to reflect, maybe to journal, as some of you are in the habit of doing, that we notice this, this, the way the chain of events worked, the, that, that meeting that was happenstance, you know, that, that phone call at just that, that precise time, that was not chance, it was providence. Commonly enough, and, and you all, I think, can speak of an event in your own life like this, maybe many of them, God closes the door. 
and then opens another one. You've seen this. You've experienced this. But the real weight of it, the significant, occurs to your heart only in the quiet of contemplation of God's goodness to you. However it happens, when we have prayed, we must wait for God's answer persistently, wait patiently, wait quietly, and then finally, submissively. We must wait for God's answer to our prayers submissively. It's fairly difficult to translate. It is clear here that Habakkuk is actually waiting for God's correction. He's waiting for God to correct him. He's, He's laid out his struggle with God here with blatant honesty. He doesn't understand, Lord, how can you do this? How can you act this way? How is it possible, Lord, that you are doing this? How can you bring wicked men to punish those less guilty than themselves? How can you, Lord, raise up a wicked nation at all when you are the thrice holy God and inflexibly holy? He said some things that that he knows instinctively are going to need some correcting here. He knows his view is too short, that his own vision is too dim fully to understand. He knows this himself full well. He expects facts to be corrected. That's the spirit with which you and I must come to the Lord in prayer and wait for the answers. Acknowledging, Lord, sometimes I'm not even asking the right questions because I don't even know how to ask. I don't even know what to ask. I don't understand the situation. I'm baffled. I don't understand you, Lord, and your ways. What I need is not so much the exact thing that I'm asking for, perhaps, Lord, as much as I need light to understand what to ask for and and why maybe what I'm asking for here might even be the wrong thing. Or maybe I'm asking for the right things, Lord, but I'm asking in the wrong way. This is how I lift my prayers to you, Lord. As I often hear you pray so wonderfully, Lord, your will be done. Your will be done. I submit to you. At any rate, we are much more likely to receive the answers to our prayers when we go to God, not with our heads you know, thrown up high, but in humble dependence, waiting, Not with a demanding fist, but with an open hand, ready to receive what and when and how he's answering. To see what he gives and to receive it gladly. Sometimes the answer is not going to be what you expected. Sometimes the answer is not going to be what you desired. Oftentimes the answer to our prayers come in the form of reproof, don't they? And and correction, as much as they do in encouragement. Although the wise Christian knows how to receive reproof and correction with encouragement, don't they? To kiss the rod. But I tell you now on the authority of God's own word that your prayer life will be much more satisfying to you. In fact, will be downright thrilling and invigorating to you if you will learn not only to pray, but to pray persistently, waiting persistently, waiting patiently, waiting quietly, waiting submissively for his answer. And he will. He always will. Though the answer seems slow, wait for it. It will surely 